I'm Joyce Olivier. I've uh, been in the uh, uh, Directorate Reuse and Valuation for uh, 10 years now almost. Um, rating is my passion. I've always been involved with the rating uh, uh, program and um, I'm very, uh, feel very privileged to talk to you today and give you a little bit more information about how the rating system works. Um, it's officially called the MRF Evaluation and Rating of the Service, but we all refer to it as rating. Um, my colleague Talia asked me for questions and um, apparently there will be some questions coming in to her on Twitter and we decided we'll keep them at the end so then she will repeat them to me if there's any or um, I suppose that's the only mechanism to get any questions through. Okay, just a brief outline of my presentation. I am going to discuss what is an NRF rating, uh, who can apply for a rating, why should you apply for a rating, and then a brief look at the rating categories and where do you fit into this. Um, then I'm going to be given an uh, outline of the role players and um, a little bit more on each of them, some on time frames, and then I will give a brief, uh, basically a flow diagram of how the rating process works, and then some information support uh, sources in the end. What is the NRF rating? Um, the NRF uh, rating was actually the, the, the building block of the current NRF. In uh, 1984, there was the, the CSIR was the, the, the body that funded both themselves as well as universities. Then there was a, a, a request that an agency should be uh, developed and at that stage was only the natural sciences and the uh, uh, Foundation for Research and Development was born in that year. Um, it was basically worked on the CSIR giving funding to this agency and then the, the, the universities at that stage was the, the main recipients and there had to be a plan made how to give the universities these funding and uh, the fathers of the rating system uh, used the criteria for funding that a recent research track record as assessed by peers to be the main uh, way to determine who get funding and who don't. Um, the, the social sciences humanities joined in 2002. So what you can gather from this, this is a long-standing program. Um, it's, I think very few programs can actually say they've got a 30 year plus track record. Um, the basic way that um, they uh, awarded funding in those days is used in the rating process. It is amended somewhat, but the basic idea is still, it is an assessment of your recent research track record. And it is based on basically two things, the quality and impact of your research outputs, and that's the recent research outputs, as well as your relative standing to peers based on this research outputs. Um, every year we have a, what we call a, a policy workshop because the research environment is, is, uh, is evolving all the time and um, research, like any other activity on earth, is not staying stagnant, it is, uh, things happen. We have recently the, the uh, emergence of predatory publishing. We have uh, fields evolve, uh, new fields, different uh, subfields develop. So all these things are taken into account um, with the rating system. Although it's still the same as in 1984, based on, on your recent research track record, basically peer review, we try at least to look at new developments in research in the global term. Um, at the moment, bibliometrics like the H-index is used as a supportive uh, tool. It is definitely not ignored, um, but there is also a lot of uh, uh, individualized issues with bibliometrics. So uh, the dream we had in the past was to use bibliometrics as a, as a maybe a, a individualized report for everyone. Um, the people in the community does not feel that is actually warranted yet. It is based on international peer review, as it was in 1984. Um, in 19, 2015, we used to use 500 reports, you know, those uh, uh, to rate 800 applicants, and from those 500 reports, 60% of them were peers outside South Africa. So it is quite an intensive uh, 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 project. This one. Um, the, the claim of the NRF rating system is, although it is an NRF rating, it's basically a system run by South African scholars for South African scholars. Um, it means that the NRF is basically the secretariat. We don't make the decisions. The decisions is made by peers, and that is uh, the scholars 
locally and abroad. To date, or currently we have 3,400 rated researchers. Um, of those 3,400 researchers that represent, according to Yemen's data, 30% of all higher education institution academics with a doctorate. And as you can imagine, not all of those that have a doctorate is permanently employed. If we further reduce it, then 44% of all uh, um, the above is, uh, is used or is rated. So it is a growing business. Um, uh, over the more than th 30 years, 7,200 people have been rated. And as you later on see some of them more than one time. But it, it's quite a, 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 quite a number of people that went through the system. Um, on average, we have an 8% organic growth in for first-time applicants. So this is growing people more and more apply every year. Approximately 50% of our applicants is first-time applicants and 50% uh, is revaluations. Um, as I explained, we've got an annual policy workshop where changes in the research environment is discussed and see what is its impact on the, on the rating system. And it actually always gives quite a lot of uh, lively discussion and the social sciences, humanities, and um, it is actually a, a quite a highlight of our calendar. Why should you apply for a rating? Uh, firstly, I want to say rating is to apply for one is one hundred. It's not a, a, a must. Nobody is, is forced to do it, although um, we, we quite often hear that institutions is actually quite um, push their applicants to apply for rating. Uh, basically, the rating has got uh, three things that um, is important for you and what makes it, what I consider reasons to apply for the rating. Firstly, it's benchmarking. For emerging researchers, it helps you, the feedback you get from when you apply for a rating often provides very valuable career planning. It helps you to say where are you good at and what should you do further and where are you at which stage of your career. So in terms of career planning for young researchers, this is, I think they all always comment very favorably on, on that. For established researchers, it's about maintaining and improving your levels of research excellence. Uh, most rated researchers tell us they are going to be invited within five years and they know it's kind of like the clock ticking. They need to not, I think we are all, or every day, we are totally absorbed by minor or major crises and um, longer term planning often is, is, is not something we think of. But if you know you are going to get uh, rated in five years time to maintain your rating, it, it's, it, it's, um, it's a benchmark that you know that you have to plan for. Um, often they use it as well in their, uh, um, because publishing is not a, a quick fix thing to publish in, in um, journals that is of international quality often takes time. So you really need to have a bit of a longer term approach when you uh, are rated or uh, intend to apply for a rating. The rating system is used in higher education institutions, although it wasn't designed for this, but um, every now you will see if you ask for a, a, a apply for a position, they actually put there, there's a rating is required. It's a proxy for um, peer estimation. It's used in promotions in some universities, the marketing material is often quite frequently referred to the ratings. And most important, uh, the rating system was actually originally designed for training of postgraduate students to make sure that those that train them are acknowledged researchers. And I think this is probably the most valuable um, asset that this system provides to the higher education community. And from 2008, uh, funding was really in the beginning, like I said, it was the only way you got funding. But then, uh, when the social sciences came on board, it was more government policies. Um, the link was it was delinked, and then when they uh, the, the reviewed the rating system in 2007, there was a, a big request, please relink funding. So incentive funding came into being in 20 to, from 2008. Um, the RE mandate uh, reviews and evaluation is a new mandate is a new directorate that was basically two year two three years old now. Um, all the reviews and evaluation of uh, rating people, the institutions, the funding are now in one directorate. And one of the first uh, 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 documents that came about was our mandate. And in this mandate, it specifically says the intention to grow value recognition of rating in era of fin funding decisions. So there was at one stage the MCDM, the multi criteria decision making model. Um, this is not necessary now, but 
the idea is writing is a very intensive process it's quite uh, laborious and it's quite uh, capacity intensive to go through that process and then uh, 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 in some of the funding programs uh, like Saatchi there should be a bigger link to to those and some of the it's some of the um, new reviews should be could be taken up by this by ratings but that is future music Okay, who can apply for the rating? Um, the need to incentive funding uh, established in 2008 uh, meant that eligibility was scrutinized a lot more. Um, on the other hand, we also realized that the funding in the environment of research is actually has also changed. In the past, we had um, anybody that was in a dual appointee, they had to be here six months of the year, um, or they uh, the, the, the actual intention was that rating is for those that's permanently appointed, but a lot of people uh, do is appointed on soft money or um, affiliated in an honorary position. So we try to uh, make our eligibility criteria adapted to that. Uh, just one of the big things that people often don't understand is, it sounds now, but, but these three types of, of evaluation. One is a new person that's never been applied. Then we had people who had a rating previously and it lapsed, so those are our re-evaluations. And then we have those who are currently evaluated, um, they are after the fifth year of the six year term, they are invited to, to apply. So that's why we often have this uh, re-evaluation by invitation, uh, people, it's not always clear on that. Um, the biggest hurdle you have to overcome to apply, you must be affiliated with the NRF recognized institution. Those are basically the higher education institutions, the universities in South Africa, science councils, uh, museums. Um, you will, if, when you log on to the NRF system, you will first be asked what is your affiliation. But we also have, like I explained, not just permanently employed researchers. We also have a category where people are on a fixed term contract. And that would mean, for instance, dual appointees, where somebody is spending some time uh, between two local institutions, of which one is uh, you know, if recognized, or um, we have sandwich programs between an international university and a local university. I'm thinking of uh, the where they have quite, um, where they do collaborative research and research is, is, is awarded by both institutions. So those are accepted. Um, the, then we also have our retired cohort. You will all know that the African research community is, is, is aging. And, but these retired academics are often at the peak of their, their careers and they are often the best mentors. So we, uh, they are eligible for rating as long as there is, I think we've, we've made a very, make the case. Um, we, every applicant that is in a fixed, fixed term contract must uh, explain on their application, and this must be validated by the designated authority, what institutional benefit in terms of capacity building and postgraduate student supervision um, is provided by this uh, fixed term contract appointee. And there must also be some commitment that the, uh, the association will still be effective when the rating becomes valid. The rating takes almost a full year, so there's no way that you can go and use all these resources and spend it on somebody who's already left when the rating becomes valid the next year. And also there's also a need that maybe this person should be at least for a year or two, there should be some commitment. So the retired academics, honorary appointees, research associates, fellows mostly fall into this category. Then if you are uh, soon to be appointed by a, one of these recognized institutions, you can also apply uh, before the rating becomes valid. We also have a look and see whether the appointment actually took place. The eligibility criteria is available at our website, so please go and have a look there. The ranking categories, uh, where do you fit in? We've got basically Three. In the past, we always see the young researcher category and established category, but the prestigious rating category soon has recently been identified as not neither of those two, so it's a category on, their, uh, on its own. So in the established researcher category, we have a C, which is an established researcher, a B, which is an established researcher with considerable international recognition. Um, if you look on our website, there's a document that specifically says for every specific discipline in every panel what they consider to be considerable international recognition and then the A's are the leading scholars. Then we have the emerging researcher category, the Y's, 
Um, you will note in the above category, a PhD is not a requirement, but for the emerging research category, um, uh, there is a, a doctorate must be obtained no more than five years ago, and the applicant must be 40 years of age or younger at closing date. For the P category, we want the same in terms of the PhD, but uh, there is a little bit of flexibility in terms of the age, so it's 35, 36, it's about how far it will go. So these are the different categories, and one thing that people often ask me is, how do I apply for something? You don't apply, you submit your CV, and your institution provides uh, what we call the recommended institutional rating. Often people say, but then they, uh, then I can't go higher than that. If they put me up for a C, then I can never become a B. This, the way this institutional rating is used is basically to assist the Species Committee with providing a kind of like some guideline um, who to appoint as peer. So because it gives the institution who's most often right in terms of what they see as a, where they feel the person uh, fit in. But we have cases where A's are actually be, uh, be finally become C's and those that's, that, that C's become B's. So there's this, it is not that you are fixed in or um, will never be able if your institution nominates you for a specific category. Basically the role player, I think this is now becoming a bit more to how the system works. You have the applicants, you have the designated authorities at the employing higher, educa uh, higher education institutions. You have the NRF staff and the use and evaluation. There's 10 of them that works with these panels. The, you have the peer reviewers, and as I mentioned before, 60% of them are from outside South Africa. Then you have the assessment panels. The assessment panels is made up of specialist committees. There's 26 of them, um, pro uh, to date 125 members. Um, there's six assessors and six chairpersons. And then we have higher level committees. Uh, the Executive Evaluation Committee of the NRF is uh, the EEC, um, is the policy making decision body, as well as the one that, that looks at all A's and all P's, and also what we call non consensus cases. And uh, it's, it, it is notable that this is the only place or any body, decision making body, where NRF members is taking part in the decision. Uh, the Specialist Committee and the Assessors and the Chairpersons are all outside uh, the NRF. Um, so on the EEC3, uh, uh, the Executive Director or the CEO, Risa, um, is the chair of that. And there's two people from the NRF Executive Directors, plus the six chairs, plus a representative from uh, the Specialist Committees, one for the Natural Sciences and one for the Social Sciences. Those are the ones that make up the EEC. Then we have the Appeals Committee, which I'm not going to talk too much about, but uh, they are also appointed by people outside and they must, they have nothing to do with all the previous, the, all the uh, assessment panels, assessors, chairpersons, they act totally independently. The role players, I'm going to give a little bit more information. I think firstly the, the DAs and the applicants and the NRF, how are we uh, linking with each other? The application, uh, where you apply to online application, uh, you have to go to the NRF submission, the, that website, um, number there. Um, an interesting thing is that um, everybody uses the same CV when you apply for rating, for funding, or for uh, any NRF activity. So, although you go there, and for the NRF rating system, about 90% of your application is made up of your CV information, we call the CV section. That would be your career history, your research outputs in the different categories, um, uh, your specialization, so it's your basic <coughs> information. And the good news is that you can constantly fill out and make sure that it's updated. So when the call is actually open, you just migrate this data. But I thought some important things to remember when you complete your application. You must please take care when you select your primary panel. Um, currently, there's a, you can select up to three panels um, in order of priority because there's a recognition that people do work interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and all the disciplinary variants. People do change their focus in the last year. So if you worked in a specific area uh, and you've moved your research focus due to the nature of your work, 
then you can actually nominate more than three panels. And between those three panels, they actually do quite a lot of consultation with each other. Although you are only recognized or only evaluated in one panel, the panels do make sure that all your bases are covered and they do consult with each other to identify the viewers, period. Then the best five research outputs, be selective of those. Those are the ones that is provided to the, app, uh, to the reviewer. The reviewer must indicate that he has read them. So uh, make sure that those are, are good choices. I think often people put up um, like my, uh, um, my um, presentation here, please, that is not, I think that's not a good thing. It should be a, probably, it is better to look at this key research areas document of ours and see what is the really important types of outputs and go with those. And like I said, you need to have an electronic copy available and it is, it's uploaded and made available to the peer reviewers. Then when you nominate reviewers, please make sure that's an opportunity because, uh, as I'll explain later, um, if you do that badly and people are not um, really peers, like they are close collaborators, or they are not necessarily uh, in all cases, but if they are friends and, and working in the same department, um, then it's often they are found not to be suitable or, or independent reviewers, and often they are then not uh, made as out as appropriate reviewers by the Species Committee. Uh, also make sure that you provide good reasons for why you nominate that. That really gives guidance to the Species Committee for why they are appropriate to do this review. Then your research fields and specialization. If you, if you uh, uh, complete those fields well, you really help and assist the Species Committee to have a look and to see where is the most appropriate reviewers. Um, if, you, if you do just give the broad outline, it makes their job quite a lot more obvious. Please ensure that your outputs are correctly categorized. And we, the recent phenomenon of predatory journals, um, the fact that it's published in a predatory journal does not mean it's bad research. Um, the fact, it only means that it's not published in a peer review journal because in a predatory journal, uh, you pay the publisher to publish your uh, um, paper. Often uh, there's actually quite a, a lot of talk about that, but make sure that you um, are not falling into that trap. Uh, and, and if you have published in there, put it in your not in peer reviewed outputs. Don't confuse a conference presentation that's peer reviewed with uh, just a, you know, a conference proceedings output but with the presentation, uh, because it, it makes uh, the reviewers as well as the species committee um, think less of you if you don't put it in, uh, in the, the correct. Um, category. Please ensure that your outputs are correctly referenced. Make sure the output journal is the correct journal. Um, make sure the author sequence is correctly reflected. Um, often we have the students do the input on the database for the uh, uh, reviewer or the, or for the applicant. Uh, please make sure that you actually make sure that it is correctly because you know that author sequence has a meaning for your peers. So although you might say it's just total innocence, um, I have had cases where it was considered in, in view of that it, it's this unethical conduct there, so uh, don't, don't do that. Uh, make sure that your contribution for every output you've put up is, is, is well informed. It's not, don't just put your percentage. Uh, put up, you've been done the data uh, analysis or you were the main writer or these actually quite nice examples on the system for you to use. Um, quite often we have, if people work in teams, that the, um, people don't know who's actually the driver, who's, so, so this um, field you have, use it optimally, make sure you put what was your role in getting this output, um, that it's, it's made for the reviewer as well as the species community. Um, use the opportunity provided for your narratives. If something, you were ill at some stage, females who, who were out of their career into child rearing, uh, please explain those in your narratives. Um, it, it makes, uh, it contextualizes both the reviewer as well as the species committee how your profile looks. Um, then we have as part of our role players, the applicants and the DAs. They should be in an institutional partnership. I think your first port of call when you start an application or think of starting one, go to your research office and ask them what support they, they give and what is their screening, internal screening deadlines and that it's, I think they are your, your best friends in, in, in this uh, endeavor. 
The DI submitted the proposed institutional rating, I've already alluded to that. Um, when the closing date for applicants is mid-February of every year, and for the, what, the resident authorities, they have two weeks where they can do the final tweaking before they submit. Then the peer reviewers. Uh, peer review is the foundation of the rating system. I always say if you uh, mix anything up or, or it's not so good in it, just make sure that the peer reviewers if you select good peer reviewers, then you already done quite a, a big chunk of, 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 of getting into the process. Um, the process works like this. The applicants, when they apply, have the opportunity to nominate six reviewers. Um, they also have an opportunity to indicate excluded reviewers. Um, for instance, if there was a conflict of interest or an ideological difference. Um, and as I already alluded to, make pre, no, please make sure they are peers. It's an opportunity because if you work that well, three of those are going to be used to uh, review your work. Um, if you nominate inappropriate people, that is maybe your too close collaborators or people that you've met, but they don't really say, uh, uh, quite a lot of people put up uh, reviewers and then when you go to them, they say no, they don't have the time to go and read your work. So uh, it should be kind of balance of, they must be, just think about that clearly. Is this is what is the chance of this person actually going to do my my work, review my work? In a species committee, they, their task is to nominate six more reviewers, what we call the independent reviewers. Um, they use the guidelines for selection of reviewers, which is one of our policy documents, and they use it to select and prioritize these twelve reviewers. They prioritize them in the approach first and either appropriate or not appropriate. So. The, why we do that is our decline rate is across the board approximately 50%. So if we have 12 names, we're going to approach six immediately. And if all goes well, those six are all going to, to uh, submit the report, those other six is not invited because we don't want to, we've got this phenomenon of reviewer fatigue and we don't want to over review anybody. Uh, so we we, we have this process of six, six, and like I say, our goal is actually to have three from your nominated list and three independent. Um, that is what we aim for. Uh, when the reports come in, they are assessed by the Species Committee for first usability. Um, not all reports are equal. Some of them are good, some of them are excellent, some of them are satisfactory, some of them are biased. Some of them are not usable because there's just so little information in it or no, there's absolutely no uh, assessment done. So those reports, they, stay, they serve at the meeting, but they are not used. Then every um, species committee must also look at the report and say what they think this reviewer placed the applicant in. For instance, in a C category, B category, based on what the, the questions they asked in the report. Like I said, uh, we aim to have six reports for every applicant. But due to some reports not being of the, uh, good quality, we aim for four reports of acceptable quality, expressing consistent opinion, uh, that is our benchmark. For the B's and the A's and the P's, we will never accept four only. But if it is for a C or a Y rating, and they all are, it's just absolutely the same, they all sing the same song, four reports will be used as um, enough. The species committees, they are the backbone of our system. They are the people that really, really work very hard. And it is quite an arduous job. They give it selfishly, or selflessly, not selfishly, selflessly. And um, we are nothing without them. We are basically, they are the ones that, that do all the, the work. Um, like they all must be rated researchers and they all are active researchers and they are all like I say, I cannot praise their, uh, them enough. We've got 26 species committees. They are disciplinary based, but it's, um, the list is on the website if you want to look. They are from health sciences, who's done is, is, is divided into three panels to uh, mystery, chemistry. They, like I say, they are disciplinary based, but sometimes disciplines are mixed, like um, economics, management, um, accounting, and um, administration. Who's similarly in, in the field that um, they were specifically selected like that by the community. The convener is our main contact. Um, he's the very hard working, he and she are very hard working people. They need to liaise with us and they need to liaise with the species committee. 
Um, they make sure that there's timelines and that we keep to them. The task of the species committees is to read applications and uh, it is important, although they're not reviewers, they need to know uh, the context and how, when they appoint reviewers, you need to know that this is appropriate in this, the, the, the total context. Um, they also need to screen for the right panel. If a person is um, have more than one panel, they have a look at that and amongst themselves they decide on which is the most appropriate panel. That's always done in consultation with the applicant. They look for premature applications. Um, you will have a look later on what we mean with premature applications. Um, it is, if an application is obviously, this person is, is not, it doesn't look like it fulfills all the criteria, it actually is better to refer it back to the applicant now than actually go through the whole process. Um, the nominating, prioritizing, and ratifying what's done by the convener of reviewers. So they, they go through quite a lot of, lot of effort they use various resources, they must say why they think this is an appropriate reviewer and why is it a peer. Uh, all those things are recorded. And so it's a, when a decision is actually made, it must be made sure that it's an appropriate mix of uh, reviewers for that specific person in his or her career. Uh, they assist the reviewer reports. Uh, like I said, although the members of the species committee does not themselves, they're not allowed to evaluate and review the applicant, they only review the reports they need to say what they think the report is saying. Uh, and amongst themselves, they need to find consensus. They do this independently, but that is um, the, the, in, in a fact that people often don't realize. They do write the feedback for the applicants, and they um, advise the NRF on any policy or matter that's, that needs their input. And like I said, there's quite a lot of consultation with them. The assessment panel, as I mentioned, they are three voices, the species committee, the assessors, and the chairpersons. Um, a fact that you is often not realized by everybody that every, all members of the panel, that is now the species committees, who is, can be from three to eight members, or six members, the assessors, who must, is, is one, and the chairperson in every assessment panel is one, so at least they must read all members of panel have to read every report for every applicant. So that means five to eight set of independent eyes look at your application before the decision is made. And I think that should give you quite a lot of, that's a good check and balance that the, 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 the chance that one person can influence or the outcome is, is, is quite, is not so, is, is actually quite slim. The assessors and chair, they may not be from the same discipline as the species committee, but they are very familiar with the system and they are normally wise people. Uh, the assessor and chair attend three, four to five panel meetings each. The role of the assessor is there to benchmark standards, that's why you need to attend more than one panel, and ensure fairness and consistency in applying the rating criteria. And the chair's role is he's basically there to facilitate the decision making at the panel meeting and also act as a second assessor. Okay, time frames. The rating is valid for six years, for example, once this year started 1 January, they were, they were evaluated last year and it's valid until 31 December 2021. They are invited to reapply in the fifth year, while the sixth year, while it remains valid, they get reviewed again. The period under review is the past eight years. It always overlap between two periods, for example, 1 January 2009 to 31 December 2016. For those, that is, will be the, um, now, is now in process will be in process next year. The results is normally available. We start September and sometimes it's uh, those nasty cases which you can't find last up to February. But for the majority of cases, the panel meeting, within a week after the panel meeting, your designated authority gets informed of the outcome. Uh, but then we still need to wait for the feedback before the uh, uh, official outcome letter is sent. Um, as I explained previously, you can update your CV all the time. There's no, if, if, any time now, most people make a, make it a part of their annual to go and update his CV, put in new, new information, and um, that's always a good thing to do. So you don't have to wait for when the call opens, in, in normally September, October, you can start immediately with your CV section. Um, then you only need, when the call opens, you migrate that stuff through, and then complete the narrative sections.
and uh, the meeting dates and panel member names are posted on the website, so that's always a useful thing to know. The process itself, this is just a high level, um, I'm not going to spend too much time, it's basically submitting your application, then there's the screening by the designated authorities, um, then you submit to the NRF and then it's screened again, uh, technically by my staff and then by the Species Committee member, they look at the application in the right Species Committee, primary panel, uh, or is it premature and there's constant uh, back and forth between the NRF, the Species Committee, as well as the institution. Then when all goes through and the uh, reviewers have been nominated, ratified and found to be appropriate, we uh, engage to get these six reports um, to, for every applicant. And it's quite, a, that's what my staff is busy now, it's quite an uh, intensive period because it's, it's, uh, it, it's quite a lot of emails and send forward pleading, like I say, 50% of our reviewers. Not necessarily for, for any devious reasons, maybe they're just overburdened or they are, um, uh, not, they are not available this time. So we get these reports in. Um, this is available immediately to the Species Committee members online. So the moment the report comes in, they can really start working on it. Now, I think that is one of our panel members, uh, that is one thing what is really accommodating them. They can start throughout the year when they have a spare moment, they have internet access, they can immediately plan their work schedule because we know they are busy people. Um, the meeting docs, like I say, is available to the assessment panels. It's online through the Species Committee. Some chairs and assessors also log in, but uh, the chairs and assessors seems to be more paperless. But we make it available to them well in time. And then they need to prepare independently, um, look at every report, see whether it's appropriate, see whether the, what the uh, uh, report says. And then they get to the meeting, that's the second step, step of the independent preparations. Then at the panel meeting, there is, um, they provide the information. Well, firstly, it starts off with a briefing. The briefing is done by the chair and it talks to the specialist committee and tells them what's expected of them, what's policy changes, what's the policy they need to, to, to use. Then, because they've already independently prepared, they get a consolidated sheet of the independent contributions. They go then and normally in the afternoon sit and they work out based on a consensus view for every applicant. The, uh, the, the assessor meets the next day and then after the species committee put their view where they think the applicant belongs, writing out the category and based on the number of reports, the assessor gives the same information and if the chair is uh, in agreement, then the, the writing is, uh, outcome is finalized. Um, if it's an A or a P, they are referred to the executive radiation committee. An alternative is often that they found there's not enough reports, then it's dreaded more reports cases, and people often wonder why, uh, uh, often the biggest problem where we need more reports is if a person is on a task between two categories, and the review reports say, half say one thing and the other, say, and the other half say something else. So in those cases, we often need more than six reports. So don't feel um, concerned often it's a, it's a good sign that if you need more reports because the one thing the species committees and the assessment panels they won't take a decision that is not well informed and procedurally fair to the applicant. Uh, those more reports cases are finalized by virtual meetings um, and those are the ones that often take up to February. Um, the, if it's a, the, uh, all, all outcomes are as soon as possible um, we sent to the DAs and then there's also an appeals committee which is uh, 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 an option. Um, key criteria for established researchers. If you look on our website there is quite definition and this is uh, um, called often, this is the, the basic document uh, which I think more or less survived through all these years. What is an established researcher? I think there's a few loaded words there which are highlighted in blue. First is a sustained record, and it's recent, it's last eight years. Sustained meaning that um, if you had in, in, in all eight years, only one year produced eight or nine app, um, outputs and the others not, it either needs to be explained or it is not sustainable. So it's a, it, it could be, that those are looked, up, uh, looked at and wondered by both the reviewers and the species committee. 
the field, meaning there must be some place, you discipline where you have your own, your, your field of research, where you have some focus and where there's some depth. And you are recognized by your peers, as I said, it's a peer review system. You must have a body of quality work, a body meaning that it can mean every, different things in different disciplines. In some cases, it might be one book. In, uh, if you're in social science, it's humanity. Um, if you're in mathematics, it can mean something else. If you are in medicine, it means something different as well. Quality, mostly the proxy is um, the journals you publish in, citations, those are uh, uh, signifying quality. Uh, this work, this body of work of yours, must have coherence and attest uh, to ongoing engagement with the field. That means there must be focus, depth, and there must be a theme in your work. Um, quite often, people, uh, um, I actually the next uh, bullet with uh, demonstrate the ability to conceptualize problems and apply research methods to investigate them. Quite often, you have people in the support role that um, is got an either an instrument or they are doing data analysis. So they've got lots of uh, lots of papers, but they are never the driver, the conceptualized the one that conceptualize. So they might have lots of papers, but the common thread is often missing. And there, those are looked at the coherence issue. Um, there must be some evidence of research independence and leadership, leadership in a broad sense, not necessarily in the field, but that you are making, growing your own little group, your own little team. Uh, indicators there are senior or first author papers, and it's discipline specific. Your own group, your own students, and often we ask how many outputs, the system weighs and not, does not count, uh, although you cannot get away from numbers because uh, your peers will know in your field this is an acceptable number. Um, as I said, it's discipline specific. There is a document called Key Research Areas and Types of Research Outputs on our website, which tells you for every specialist committee how they see this. Almost done. Um, how do this uh, criteria use? Um, I think that this, this one is actually, this is also part of our base document. When are you placed in the C1, when are you placed in the C2, and when are you placed in the C3? I've highlighted some words there. All firmly convinced, overriding, not yet considerable international recognition, firmly convinced, some international recognition. Uh, the next slide is going to show you an example of this. If you look at this, uh, the consensus in this case, there were six review reports for both of them. First case review one said the C, reviewer two said the C, reviewer three said the C, reviewer four said there is some elements of, of, of international recognition already visible, reviewer five said the C, reviewer six also said this, this is really on the cusp of a C and a D. Because there is, all of them are firmly convinced that you are a C, but not enough to put you in the next category of the B or the C1. So if you if two of those those C classes were, were firmly convinced that you'll be, you might have been a C1. But in this case, you have some, and then, that's why I say C2 is actually, it's a, it does not say you don't have any, any international recognition. The C3, there are some people what's not firmly convinced, if you two, for instance, was not firmly convinced, if you three as well, if you six actually submitted a report that was less complementary, but in those days there's enough evidence that you are an um, established researcher. For the emerging researchers, um, the basic uh, premise is that you have the potential to become established uh, according to those five criteria, quality, quantity, coherence, sustainability, and conceptualization in the next five years time. So if you apply now, the potential must be there. It's still based on the quality and impact of your publications, and it's mostly from your postdoctoral work. Your, your doctoral work will also be taken into consideration, but there is a need that, that there actually be some way that a reviewer can assess based on your postdoctoral work that you actually have potential. It's considered if you're still in your doctoral phase that you work under supervision, but now you need to, to uh, uh, spray your, get, get off the runway. And there is some evidence needed that you actually have started your own career and it's no longer just under somebody's wings or shadow. And I think the important thing is make sure that your doctor is fully published uh, and also that your narrative is explained, uh, your future vision. Uh, publishing good journals, as we've always there, 
and I think do not apply too early. If you've just got your PhD and you're still very busy publishing, I think it's not the right time. Um, there's make make sure that you have uh, at least something, some body of work there. And then my last slide is just your information sources and support. All the designated authorities of these research offices, like I say, making your first port of call, they are the ones that's very knowledgeable and can support you very much. Um, the NIDK has a support desk with applications and also my professional officers in my rating team. The NIDK website, have, it's not very clear there, but uh, if you go to that website, you will find all the documents you need. And that is it. Thank you very much for listening to me. I am not sure this is a, a, a foreign experience to me to talk uh, to basically to the PowerPoint slide, but um, I hope you find it of some interest. And my name is on the website. If you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to come back to me. I apologize for the hitches we had, um, but hope this was of some, some use to you. Thank you very much.